Hey folks, and welcome to our introductory video on Christian Metz's The Imaginary Signifier, Psychoanalysis, and the Cinema. Christian Metz is often considered the first uh, major figure of contemporary film theory, which is that dividing line between classical film theory, which is interested in aspects of the medium and medium specificity. Contemporary film theory, you start to get an interest in structures of signification, ideology, and social issues. This particular book was published in 1977, though it was based on an essay of the same name, The Imaginary Signifier, which had come out just years earlier. It's a landmark text of psychoanalytic film theory and apparatus film theory. It draws on psychoanalysis, that is Freud and Lacan, to examine the experience of film, especially structures of identification. So we're going to get into psychoanalysis in a minute, but if you're not familiar with that term, I think the most important thing that I want to make clear is that psychoanalysis is not the same thing as psychology. Psychoanalysis is a set of theories and therapeutic techniques related to the study of the unconscious mind, especially unconscious desire. The two big names associated with psychoanalysis are Sigmund Freud on the left and Jacques Lacan on the right. Lacan is a reader of Freud who writes throughout the 20th century. Integrating an understanding of Freud into a larger philosophical framework, especially contemporary French thought, including things like structural linguistics and structuralism more generally. If the unconscious is the cornerstone of all psychoanalytic thought, here's a rundown of what the unconscious is. For the psychoanalyst, the conscious involves a small portion of the mind we're aware of in our day-to-day -day lives, thoughts, sense perceptions, but the unconscious includes the desires and drives we are unaware of, but often influence our actions and behaviors, things like fears, unacceptable sexual desires, violent motives. The main goal of psychoanalysis is to make us aware of our unconscious desires and how the unconscious works. Doing so, the psychoanalyst believes, will help allay our neuroses. So what are the major questions that Christian Mess is trying to answer in this book, The Imaginary Signifier? Well, they're very big, broad questions, and they kind of go like this. Why do we go to the movies? Why does it appear to have such a hold over us? Why is cinema distinctly pleasurable? And how are we able to understand movies? In fact, understand them so well, so intuitively. The secondary question is something like this. What is it about cinema as a medium that produces this hold over human subjects, given a psychoanalytic understanding of human subjects? So the presumption by Metz here is that there is something about a psychoanalytic understanding of how the human mind works that might be useful for understanding how cinema works, especially since he thinks cinema as a medium is so effective. So let's look at that question of cinema as a medium that's bound up in this question. And this is how the excerpt that we're going to look at begins. I'm looking at a excerpt from the Brody Cohen anthology, Film Theory and Criticism. And in this video, I'm only going to look at the beginning, which is about identification mirror. So let's check out the first sentence. He says, among the specific features of the cinematic signifier that distinguish the cinema from literature, painting, etc., which ones by nature call most directly on the type of knowledge that psychoanalysis alone can provide? That's a rather straightforward question. What aspects of cinema are amenable to psychoanalysis as a mode of constructing knowledge about how human psychology works? But first, there's a bit of jargon in this sentence that I just want to make sure we understand. The jargon is the term cinematic signifier. It's in the title of the text, so let's figure out what it means. So he's getting the term signifier from structural linguistics, a study of signs and particularly language that began with this philosopher named Ferdinand de Saussure, a linguist. The idea is simple, is that when we're studying signs, and linguistic signs in particular, we can think of a sign as having two aspects, the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the thing that you see or hear. It's the sound tree as it comes out of my mouth, or it's those four squiggles, T-R-E-E, -E, that you see written on a chalkboard. The signified is the concept that comes to your mind when you hear that word uttered or you see that word written on a chalkboard. The idea of that thing that has bark and has leaves and that blows in the wind. So when Christian Metz says what he's trying to investigate is the cinematic signifier, what does he mean by that? Well, think about it this way. The signifier of film is the stuff that we see and hear when we go to a movie. Think of the play Macbeth by William Shakespeare. We can imagine three different versions of the play Macbeth through different media. One, when we read the play Macbeth. Another, when we see the play Macbeth. And yet another, when we watch a movie Macbeth. 
when we read or see the character Macbeth, we're going to have a similar signified. We're going to be confronted with the imaginary fictional king of Scotland in Shakespeare's play. The signified is Macbeth, the fictional king of Scotland. But the signifier across each three of those art forms is very different. That is, the stuff that we read or the things that we see are very different. And Metz is asking, what are the specific features of the cinematic signifier that distinguish it from literature or painting? that lend itself to psychoanalysis. And this is how he begins this part. He largely does a comparison between cinema and theater. And he says that what defines theater is that the things or people, that is the signifiers that, are, that we're confronted with, are present to us. What seems specific to theater is that even though I'm watching a fictional representation of Macbeth, the King of Scotland, I'm confronted with a very real human being. The signified is fictional, the signifier is in some sense present to me, real. If I read Macbeth, though, we get something like the opposite. The things or people, that is the signifiers, are completely absent to me. I'm not seeing anything real. I'm only reading words that conjure to my mind the signified of Macbeth the character. The things and people are completely absent to me. Cinema is somewhere in between. The things or people, that is the signifiers, are falsely present to us. They're both present and absent. This idea that cinema is both present and absent, that it's a bit of a paradox, is central to Christian Metz's book. And it's partly the reason why he calls the book the imaginary signifier. The title of the book announces the claim that the essence of the cinematic signifier is that it is imaginary. And indeed, this makes sense in the ordinary language understanding of the word imaginary. When you imagine something, it is falsely present to you, both present and absent. When I imagine a tree, I am, in some sense, imagining an image of a tree. The nature of my imagination is somewhat pictorial, but I know that that tree is not present to me. It is much closer to seeing a tree in cinema than it is seeing a tree in the theater. Metz will expound on this idea that cinema is the imaginary signifier here. He'll say the unique position of the cinema lies in this dual character of its signifier, unaccustomed perceptual wealth, but at the same time stamped with unreality to an unusual degree. There's that idea of the paradox. It's, it's saturated with presence. The images look so lifelike. And yet, if I tried to reach out and touch them, I would just be touching a flat screen. They're merely light on a surface. This is why he says, more than the other arts, the cinema involves us in the imaginary. But there's also another valence of the term imaginary. Christian Metz's book is saturated with an attention to the psychoanalyst theorist Jacques Lacan, for whom the word imaginary is a very important concept. In Lacan's writings, there are three registers of experience called the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. The imaginary involves those kinds of experiences that are concerned with images and imagination. That's why it's called imaginary. It's not so much the same definition as our ordinary language use of the term. It's more like that which concerns the image. And keep in mind here, when I say image, I don't mean necessarily that which is perceptual or perceivable. The symbolic register of experience concerns the domain of signs, language, codes. Once human beings have ascended into language acquisition, once we start to speak, once we think of ourselves as I, once we even have the word I to refer to ourselves, once we give ourselves that kind of stability that language gives us, and once we start kind of subordinating ourselves to the social codes that operate within a linguistic world, Say, I can talk to my boss a certain way, but I won't talk to my friend that same way. And I won't talk to my mother that same way either. That's the register of the symbolic. The real is a special category that has to do with that which exists outside structures, outside language, outside the image. And it really doesn't play a role in Christian Metz's text, so I won't get into it. All that matters for our purposes is that when Metz says cinema involves unaccustomed perceptual wealth, but at the same time stamped with unreality to an unusual degree, you can almost hear Lacan's idea of the imaginary. You might say that that describes the imaginary register perfectly. Not so much that the imaginary involves unaccustomed perceptual wealth, but that the imaginary is often discussed in Lacan with a sense of an image quality and also an inherent falseness. This sounds a bit abstract, but it'll make a little bit more sense in a minute. So let's get back to that Metz quote. He says, what defines the cinema is the presence and the absence fused together. And then he says, thus, film is like a mirror. So let's just make that pretty clear. In cinema, the things we see are falsely present to us, both present and absent, in a similar way. When we look in a mirror, this, the things we see, that is ourselves, 
are also falsely present to us, both present and absent. And the main reason that Metz makes this analogy is not simply because cinema resembles a mirror, but because cinema resembles the mirror stage, which is an important theory within the writings of Jacques Lacan. It just so happens that the mirror stage is also, for Lacan, the moment that the human being ascends into the realm of the imaginary. So what is the mirror stage? It's an idea that tries to help us understand the nature of human selfhood by calling on a primordial thing that happens to human beings when they're infants, looking in the mirror for the first time. So imagine an infant who has never recognized him or herself in the mirror. Before the mirror stage, the infant doesn't distinguish itself from the world. What do I mean by that? The infant might see its own arms or see its own legs, but why should we assume that the infant has a clear sense of itself as separate from the world that it perceives, or as separate from its mother, whom it is attached to, and who gives it pleasure? The theory is that once the infant recognizes itself in the mirror for the first time, something radically changes. The infant identifies with its image, which is itself an object in the mirror. For the first time, the infant sees itself sitting next to the objects that are reflected in the mirror. It sees itself as an object in the world in a way that it might not have seen itself as an object in the world. The mirror image thus provides an ideal and thus false sense of self for the infant. The image of itself is more perfect than the infant's unwieldy experience of its own body. Keep in mind that this is a time in the infant's life where it's not really good at controlling its own body. So the theory goes, it can see a sense of itself as a whole being. And this picture of the infant, a picture which is merely a picture, the picture itself doesn't contain or summarize the complexity of what's going inside the infant. But for that very reason, it's a nice feeling. It's soothing. It's soothing in its falseness. So the idea goes that the mirror stage is merely the beginning of a thing that happens throughout our whole lives. That we search for idealized images of ourselves all the time. That the I continually looks for a sense of itself in the exterior world. Metz reinforces this idea. The child looking in the mirror identifies with itself as an object. But here's where the analogy for Metz breaks down. And this is one of the reasons that Metz's adoption of the mirror stage in his own film theory is different from some of his fellow film theorists who also adopt the mirror stage. He says, unlike the mirror, there is one thing and one thing only that is never reflected in the screen, the spectator's own body. With what then does the spectator identify during the projection of the film? The spectator, he says, identifies with himself, with himself as a pure act of perception. So this is one of Metz's big ideas, but it's a bit puzzling and counterintuitive. What does it mean to identify with yourself as a pure act of perception? So let's at least consider what it doesn't mean. What he's not saying is that the main source of identification in film is identifying with characters. That, I think, is the most common understanding of identification we get since Metz. That we see characters on screen, and we identify with them, or at least identify with one of them, the one who is carrying the story. But no, instead of thinking of the ways that we might identify with Jimmy Stewart when we're watching Rear Window, I would rather you think about moments like this in the same film. Moments when the camera is moving freely through space, and we are enjoying the fact that our eyes can move freely through this world in a way that we cannot move throughout the actual world. That there's a pleasure in the fact that a film is a series of visual displays of a world for me. You can think of that same idea with montage or editing. Editing allows us to transport ourselves to the most ideal view of a world in a way that we could not move in the world by ourselves. It is a kind of fantasy of perception. Metz will put it this way. It's not just identifying with yourself as a pure act of perception, but as a kind of transcendental subject. By transcendental subject, he simply means a kind of fantasy of an all-seeing subject not fettered by the body. It transcends the limits of the body. Another way he'll put it, and this is his title of the section in which he discusses this, is the all-perceiving subject. I can perceive all. Editing can flash from one point to another. Camera movement can have me glide and fly throughout the world. What extends from this is that this identification with the self in an act of perception is also an identification with the camera. Metz will say, as the spectator identifies with himself as look, the spectator can do no other than identify with the camera too. Metz, in other words, wants to pose an analogy between us sitting in the theater looking at the screen and the camera in the world looking at the thing it's recording. It's almost like when we watch a movie, Metz says, we are the camera or we are at the place of the camera, the thing that is capturing the images and responsible for the image that we see on the screen. 
And the name for this kind of identification is primary cinematic identification. So identifying with one's own look or identifying with the camera, as it's often put in summaries of Metz's work, is called primary cinematic identification. All the other kinds of cinematic identification, including identifying with characters, is relegated to what he calls secondary identification. In the work of Metz, it's important to know that he spends a lot more time discussing the primary cinematic identification. That's what matters to him. What's some of the response to this idea? Well, the most common response in the history of film theory, especially with folks like Laura Mulvey and people who study identity, identities like gender and race, will say that secondary cinematic identification matters too. Mulvey will say that it matters what kinds of people are up on screen and what kinds of stories are being told because those things are the conditions of feeling that all-powerful seeing eye feeling that Metz thinks that everyone can feel. So Mulvey will say, in classical Hollywood film, the man controls the film fantasy and also emerges as the representative of power in a further sense, as the bearer of the look of the spectator. This is made possible by structuring the film around a main controlling figure, often a man with whom the spectator can identify. So it's important to know that while Laura Mulvey's essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, a landmark of feminist film theory, is often taught as a standalone essay in many introductory film courses, in the history of film theory, it is very much a response to the apparatus theory of Jean-Louis Baudry and Christian Metz, both of which are not really considering human difference based on identity, and also the ways in which particular films of particular eras might privilege certain identities on screen, and that these questions have to be considered make grand claims about the nature of cinematic experience. So Mulvey will also use the mirror stage from Jacques Lacan, but she's not going to have the same conclusion because she's going to make an analogy between the baby seeing itself and the spectator seeing a character with whom he identifies. And she's going to say, and she's going to say that the way films are organized in the classical era with straight white men doing the work, making the plot flow, and women being the passive objects of male desire, that these things are going to create a mirror stage that works comfortably for certain kinds of people, that is men, but not comfortably for others, that is for Mulvey, women. Okay, so that's it for our rundown of identification and mirror stage in Christian Metz's The Imaginary Signifier. Thanks.